Uh, lots of cultures have um, uh, resurrection stories and virgin birth stories. Dionysus, a Greek uh, god of wine, uh, uh, converted water into wine, drank the, the body and blood of, of, the, of the creator of the universe. And, and, uh, and, and Osiris, the Egyptian god, way predating Judeo-Christian gods, uh, had a kind of a resurrection and savior story, such that first, if the pharaoh believes in Osiris, he, he gets everlasting life, then the pharaohs figured out that you can employ people to build pyramids much better if you give them the promise of the afterlife also. And that expanded into basically accepting a savior type person uh, to achieve everlasting life. So we see that happening so that, uh, everywhere we go. Hello, Bezel Triple Three here. That was Michael Shermer, professional skeptic and one of the panelists on Nightline's series entitled, Does God Have a Future? Michael was spouting off with the old Christianity as copycat myth argument in a continued attempt to discredit Christianity. What he failed to disclose in this wine-making with Dionysus is that the non-historical myth depicts empty cauldrons in a sealed room that were magically filled with wine the next day. Hardly the story of Jesus turning large pots of water into very high-quality wine at a wedding with many people drinking and commenting on it. However, if you're interested in the so-called similarities between Jesus and ancient mythical figures, I'll post a link in the info section uh, to a video I did that goes into much more detail on this topic. Now, joining Shermer on stage was professional atheist Sam Harris, New Age guru and medical doctor Deepak Chopra, and spiritual mystic Gene Houston. The debate was moderated by Nightline's Dan Harris, no relation to Sam, who said this to start things off. Hi, I'm Dan Harris, and this is a Nightline face-off. Our question is, does God have a future? All of us have had the is there a God debate, I'm sure, and I suspect that somewhere on this campus tonight there are some students in the dorm room having the debate, perhaps with the assistance of non-medical marijuana. Now what I want to do is sample some statements made by all four of these individuals and show that they all take aim at historic Christianity for which I intend to defend. I am of course in disagreement with the beliefs of atheists, but I also disagree with an intentionally vague, quasi-scientific, mystical view of an impersonal God. I say a plague on both their houses. So let's begin with Deepak Chopra's definition of God. What we are going to say is that we are here to upgrade science so that we can look at a deeper level of reality where we find an infinite intelligence, an infinite consciousness. You see, Deepak's God is a non-personal, non-local God which comprises everything there is in the universe. The God of the Bible is said to be everywhere present, but Deepak's God is everything, including you, by the way. Now, Sam Harris is going to clarify the difference between what Deepak calls God and how most people who believe in God understand him. And this is very helpful. It makes me wonder why Dan Harris does not have at least one really competent biblical scholar up there to defend what these atheists really have a problem with, the infinitely powerful personal God of the Old and New Testaments. Uh, it's true that some people define God as pure consciousness or as being synonymous with the laws of nature. Uh, but if we talk about consciousness and the laws of nature, we won't be talking about the God that most of our neighbors believe in, which is a personal God who hears our prayers and occasionally answers them. Thank you, Sam. I agree completely. So why on earth are you debating two individuals who hold to an outer edge, on the fringe, marginal and irrelevant view of God? Because the God that our neighbors believe in is essentially an invisible person. It's a creator deity who created the universe to have a relationship with one species of primate. Lucky us. <laughs> and and he, he's, got, he's got galaxy upon galaxy to attend to, but he's especially concerned with what we do, and, and he's especially concerned with what we do while naked. You know, that's actually a pretty good definition of the God of the Bible. A personal God who created everything that exists and continues to hold everything together by the power of his word. This personal God made mankind in his image with the capacity to relate to him in a personal way that's distinct from every other creature God ever made. You know, I think if we could ask an antelope or a beaver or a centipede, they would indeed say, lucky us. 
Now, what was needed here were two competent Christian theologians who could have defended real, authentic Christianity rather than two neo-scientific, New Age mystics who can bring nothing concrete to the table. In fact, Michael Shermer will help make this point. Listen carefully to what he says about the God that Deepak believes in. Again, listen carefully because Michael's audio was low at this point. So what? He, stayed, he has stated, Hawking has stated on this very stage, he does not believe in God. Why he doesn't kind of believe in the dead white male that you're talking about, the straw man that you have put up, or the, or the mythical God that Sam Harris is talking the God about. you put up is a meaningless, non-local God. No, I mean? just... You see, Michael is stating that Deepak's concept of God is not only utterly inscrutable, which means unfigure outable, but also meaningless. Deepak's idea of God, or the force, is nothing more than science mingled with New Age ideas. And Michael is saying that people could care less about that. To answer your question, Dan, I, I want to get back to, to something that actually matters. The people, 90% the, the, of the people watching this on television will never have heard of non-locality. And, and if, if we could explain it to them, they're not going to care about it. They're, they're worried about Jesus. They're worried about the collision with the Muslim world. Uh, they're worried about, about uh, gay marriage. I mean, this, this, is, this is religion talk, and we're talking about the future of God. Now, That's if, the past of God. If, right? okay, so. Sam is in agreement with Michael here. He says that people are worried about Jesus and the collision with the Muslim world and gay marriage, all of which Christianity speaks to. Deepak can say that it's the past of God, as if we humans can decide what kind of God there's going to be. But Deepak, let me tell you, the God of the Bible is not going away anytime soon. Oh, oh all, of these, that? all of these religions <laughs> claim very funny. their exclusive validity. And the fact that you have Christians having deep experiences of peace, and you have Muslims, and you have atheists, and you have Buddhists, it proves that there's a deeper principle that should be talked about in a non-sectarian way that is not held hostage by Iron Age, age literature. I mean, that you know, the fact that people with conflicting views of God can experience peaceful feelings proves nothing. I can experience a deep sense of peace after a good plate of pasta and a glass of Merlot. What matters is this, is what I believe about God objectively true or not? Gene, you... You know that, that, that nowhere in human discourse is there a greater impediment to changing the story than in religion. I mean, the, the story doesn't change. The Ramayana is not going to get rewritten based You're on that You're talking about cultural mythology, not religion. I, I'm talking, not the I, religious I'm talking about the Bible, the Quran. That's all, all cultural the mythology. The, the organizing doctrines by which 99% of the people on earth who call themselves religious Still are, the past. Are Still the past. Life. We have the internet. We have ABC News. We can change that conversation. The Bible as cultural mythology? We don't need it anymore because we now have the internet and ABC News? <laughs> well, of course, there's certainly no mythology and misinformation connected with the internet and the evening news now, is there? You know, the Gospels, which form the historical foundation of Christianity, are not myth, but rather first century news accounts comprising information gathered from people who spent a lot of time with Jesus, who conveyed what really happened concerning his life, and in much more detail, his death and resurrection. They are recounting the life of a particular Jesus, who was born during the reign of Caesar Augustus while Quirinius was governor of Syria. This Jesus was brought before Caiaphas the high priest, having been accused of blasphemy. This Jesus, who was judged by Pontius Pilate, the fifth prefect of the Roman province of Judea from A.D. 26 to 36. This Jesus, whom Paul of Tarsus proclaimed to the Roman governor Antonius Felix. This, uh, I should say, the historical details of Christianity, as Paul said to Herod Agrippa, have not been done in a corner. Is your rock-solid certitude about there not being a God uh, in and of itself a form of orthodoxy? Well, I'm not rock-solid that there is no God. I would be surprised at this point, I have to say. Uh... Now that's honest of Michael to admit that he can't be certain that there is no God. If, if it was anything like uh, uh, Yahweh, I, I'd be shocked. But I actually have a little thing I would say if it turned out to be the case, what I would say standing there at the, at the pearly gates. All right, what is uh, it? Oh, well, um, I mean, first of all, it would be, uh, you, know, you, you gave me this brain uh, in your own image to that uh, it reasons and doubts and so on, and so I applied it to you. 
And that's exactly what we all should do. In fact, God has made us spiritual as well as physical beings, and so it should be natural for us to seek spiritual truth. But our fallen, sinful condition has torqued and twisted this pursuit to the point where we either fashion a false god to worship, or even worse, like Michael, we make our own intellect our god and delude ourselves into thinking that since we know a tiny bit about how things work in this world, we can know why things work in this world, which we can't and don't. And, uh... And so, in any case, why does belief matter? Shouldn't it matter more how you comport yourself in life and how you treat other people? You know, belief or trust matters a lot, since we all are trusting in something. Now, let's say I have a car with a gas gauge that is stuck at three quarters full. As I'm driving, I notice that the needle never moves. Now, if I place my trust in that broken gauge and keep driving, I will ultimately run out of gas, and all the trust in the world will not keep my car moving down the road. You see, it's not believing that's the problem. It's in what you are believing. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The heart there is synonymous with the mind. Michael, like all humans, are suffering from a sinful, darkened mind. And only the grace of God, through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus, can shed light on such a darkened mind. And I think that as it was when it is no longer the man on the cross or the man under the tree, or the man for that matter, you know, <laughs> who is... The vehicle through which the, the enlightenment and, and the epiphany occurs. Now that's it right there. Christianity is not about enlightenment. It is rather, as Gene says, about a man on a cross. It's about the God who originally made man upright and innocent, coming in space and time history to save them from their fallen condition brought upon them by the rebellion of the first human couple. Christianity is not about a transition from vice to virtue. It's about the transition from humanistic virtue to trusting Jesus Christ alone for one's restored relationship to God. But I would love to see a great generalization of, of, of spiritual experience. Now hear that again. But I would love to see a great generalization of, of, of spiritual experience. A generalization of spiritual experience. In other words, an amalgamation of conflicting and contradictory spiritual views resulting in some kind of vague spiritual feel-good session. But to what end? What's the point if one misses the true and living God? The prophet Jeremiah, whom Jesus quoted as God's very word, also said this, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. This is Christianity's objective truth claim, that the God of the Bible is the only God there is, and that this true God, at a certain point in human history, became flesh and dwelt among us to save us from our sins. It all hinges on the historicity of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. You know, if you can prove that the resurrection of Jesus did not happen in human history, I would walk away from Christianity on the spot.